Welcome to the subject manufacturing processes 2. Now our module going on is seventh screw threads and gear manufacturing methods and today's lecture will cover manufacture of gears. Now what are the contents specific instruction objectives today the basic purposes of use of gears the general applications of gears. Now before that I let me tell you that in the history of science and technology special engineering like screws or threads gears invention have been a breakthrough. So gears are very very important in engineering. So today we are discussing about manufacture of gears. The types of gears of common use that we shall discuss the classification of gears then how to specify gears and last the methods of manufacture of gears by preforming producing of gear teeth by machining and finishing gear teeth by various methods. Before we go into manufacturing we have to understand the uh, what is gear what does it do how does it work what is the shape size or configuration. Here you can see that gear is basically a cylinder or a disc having equispaced teeth or serrations around the surface. Around the surface here you see the teeth and here also and this teeth enable positive transmission of motion and power or torque from one shaft from here this is the one shaft to another shaft. So this is the gear this is basically this having uniformly distributed teeth in the con both the gears to transmit positively without slip the motion and torque between two shafts. Now here if you see from closely into the gears this is the configuration this is the configuration of the gears. Suppose there are two gears mounted on two shafts this is one shaft and this is another shaft and suppose this is the driving shaft okay this is rotating in this direction by power this will cause rotation of this gear as a result rotation of this shaft on which it is mounted. So rotation and torque are transmitted from this shaft to this shaft through this pair of gears. Now this gear and this gear have got the serrations or teeth over the surface all right and this they are the gears are in contact. Now when they are in action the tooth flanks or the faces push the teeth of the other gear tooth of one gear pushes the tooth of the other gear and this continues. Now the shape of the tooth or profile of the tooth flanks should be done taken very carefully. It should be such that the motion and torque and forces be transmitted positively that is without slip smoothly uniformly without fluctuation in speed and force with a constant transmission ratio with minimum possible wear at the contact zones through the working action contact within the teeth will be mostly in the rolling mode which will give lesser friction and longer life. Now so what are the major features that this piece circle this is called piece circle the con passing through the contact point piece circle and this is the piece circle diameter which is the major then uh, this is the tooth these are called tooth profile this is say sub, uh, addendum what is addendum addendum is the distance between the peach circle and the outer circle or the upper half of the tooth 
dedendum will be the lower portion. This portion will be called dedendum. Now, this is the line of action of the teeth. That means, the contact point between the teeth, conjugate teeth will follow this path in a straight line. So, that the forces will not fluctuate and the angle between these two, the line of action and the common tangent will constitute the angle very important called pressure angle. And this is the, this is called circular pitch that is distance between two consecutive teeth of the gear at a given point. Now, this tooth profile, now all the conditions mentioned can be fulfilled by one tooth profile uh, curve called involute. This has been found to work excellent to fulfill all the points mentioned. Now, what is involute? Involute is suppose on a cylinder a rod is rolling like this, gradually rod is rolling from here to there or here to here and the locus of the tip of the rod or any point on the rod which is rolling over the cylinder will produce a path, this path will be involute. In other way, if you take a string or thread strongly or tightly wound over the cylinder, now you gradually unwind the thread in stretch condition, then the tip of the thread will produce a path and that will be involute. Of course, other type of curves like say cycloid are often used, but if cycloid is used, all conditions will be fulfilled excepting the pressure angle which will keep on fluctuating and may cause vibration or say oscillation. Okay? This is undesirable. So, in all respects, involute profile is ideal for gear teeth, most of the gear teeth. Now, come to basic purposes of use of gears. What are the basic purposes? Positively transmit, positively transmit motion and power, rather torque as well as power between two parallel shafts. Suppose there are two parallel shafts okay, and the motion has to be transmitted from this shaft to this shaft. So, you mount two gears on them in contact. So, when this will rotate, this will rotate in the opposite direction. So, the motion, torque and power will be transmitted. This is between parallel shaft. Now, it may not be that the shafts will be parallel. It may swap on the two shafts which have got axis inclined like this, but they will be intersecting if extended. How the so motion has been transmitted from this shaft by this gear and put another gear here okay, by bevel gear and so intersecting shafts where the axis of the shafts if extended will intersect at a point. Non-parallel, non-intersecting shafts. Suppose there is one shaft here, another shaft here and now this will, go, this is neither parallel and they will not intersect. This will go over the others and if you want to transmit power in between them, you have to take a special kind of gear. Now, while transmitting power, while transmitting power from one shaft to another, what may happen that suppose you are transmitting power between two parallel shafts through a pair of gears. Okay? Now, this is one gear and this is another gear. Now, when transmission may take place without or without change in direction rotation, it is possible to keep the, the direction of rotation same or opposite. It is also possible to change the speed ratio. This may rotate fast, this may rotate slow and there may be change in the speed ratio, say increase or decrease in speed is also possible. So, these are the various purposes of use of gears. Now, general applications of gears. Now, keeping that particular use of gears of transmission, positively transmit, positive transmission of power, motion and torque between two shafts, maybe parallel, maybe non-intersecting, maybe intersecting, they have got lot of applications in engineering. For example, speed and feed gear boxes in machine tools okay, to transmit motion, rotation from motor to the job, to the tool at different speeds. Gear boxes of automobiles, car, speed drives in textile engineering, duty industry or similar machineries where lot of transmission of motion are required through gears. Speed and feed drives of various material forming machines like say wet drawing machine and uh, 
extrusion machine, they are also sometimes to reduce or control the speeds that gears are used. Machineries for mining, machineries for mining, tea industries, tree processing industries are also lot of gears used. Large and heavy duty gearboxes comprising lot of gears are used for cement and sugar industries, cranes, conveyors, windmills for accomplishing lot of rotary motions from the source of power like motors. Precision equipments like clocks, watches, meters, microscopes also use some gears. Industrial robots and toys also use lot of gears of different type and capacity. Next is broad classification of gears. There are different types of gears. Okay. Now, when we classify gears or anything, we must understand, take a consideration with what respect we are classifying them. Okay. Now, say gears can be classified according to several aspects. First aspect, according to configuration. That means external gear. This is external gear. External gear means the teeth of the gear, these are the teeth, the teeth of gears are provided on the periphery, outer surface of the wheel and here is one shaft and there is another shaft. So, rotation will be transmitted from this gear to that gear, but in such case the speed of rotation will be, direction of rotation will be opposite. If this rotates clockwise, this will rotate anti-clockwise, this is external gear in contact, but sometime we need use of internal gears having teeth inside a ring and this is used for keeping the directional rotation identical. Suppose this is one gear which is rotating in this direction okay? and then clockwise this big gear will also rotate in the same direction. So, there are a few applications uh, um, in machine tools of this internal gears, but mostly these external gears are more commonly used. According to axis of transmission, as I told you that the axis of the shafts between which power, rotation, etc., are transmitted by gears may be parallel, may be intersecting, may be non parallel, non intersecting, various possibilities are there. Now, let us see, say spar gears. What spar gears mean? Those gears which transmit power, rotation, etc., between parallel shafts, between two parallel shafts. Say here, here you can see this is one gear with a shaft like this, this is another gear parallel shaft like this. So long the shafts are parallel, they will be called spar gears, okay. but this is straight tooth. Here you can see the teeth of the gear, all the teeth of the gear are straight parallel to the axis of the shaft or axis of the gear. This is helical. Now here the teeth are slightly inclined with respect to axis of the gears. Why? Because then you get better contact, wider contact between the teeth which enable smooth running of the gears as well as transmit more torque, heavier torque unlike straight tooth. So, these are used for heavy power transmission and smooth work, but these are more difficult to manufacture slightly, so they are little costly. Now, this is double helical. Here you can see double helical, this is the one shaft, this is another shaft, both are parallel, so this is rotate in this direction this will also rotate, in, but in opposite direction and the speed ratio will depend upon the size of the tooth. This gear is small, this gear is big. So, if this gear rotates at certain speed, this will rotate at lower speed. Now, here you can see the teeth have got double helical. That means, it is stronger than single helical. The one limitation of single helix is there can be a axial force. There can be an axial force relative to that. That may cause a tendency of separation of the gears axially. So, this double helical will prevent that and this kind of double helical or herring bone gears are used for heavy duty work at high torque transmission for heavy power transmission at moderate speed or even high speed. Now, <coughs> according to axis of transmission continued. Now, previously we saw parallel shafts. Now, bevel gears transmission between intersecting shafts. Now, intersecting shafts you can see that suppose this is one bevel gear, okay. this is one shaft. So, there will be another bevel gear with another shaft. So, these are one, these are two gears. They will transmit from this shaft to this shaft. Okay, they are intersecting. Now, here you can see 
the diff this is one bevel gear this is another bevel gear this is a small bevel gear say pinion and we can call it big bevel gear or crown gear if it rotates in this direction then this will rotate in this direction okay uh, in this direction but the axis of this gear and axis of this big gear which is here they will intersect at this point now here also the same the x rotation of this small gear will cause rotation of this bevel gear and their axis are intersecting at a point here the teeth is straight here you can see the tooth are straight radial but here the teeth are slightly curved and is a called helical or spiral tooth gear and this has got capacity of transmitting more power torque etc now non parallel non intersecting shafts this shaft here the two shafts will neither intersect or nor they will be parallel so these two are parallel but those the two fingers but this will be this case is non parallel but intersecting but it will be like this neither parallel nor intersecting okay one above the other they will not intersect so in such situation what kind of gears will be appropriate now here you can see that this is one gear this is another gear this is uh, called worm and worm wheel mechanism this is called worm this is worm wheel if this rotates at high speed this will rotate at very low speed so this can be used for speed reduction this worm has got one or two teeth it basically this is a screw and this is a gear and the another thing it is irreversible normally this worm rotates at high speed and causes rotation of the worm wheel big gear at low speed it is irreversible that means if you rotate the worm wheel the worm cannot be rotated unless the helix angle is very large like say uh, very large maybe uh, 30 degree 40 degree then only it can be reversible normally worm and worm wheel are used for reduction and this is irreversible here is another example this is one bevel gear with an axis rotation rotating about this axis perpendicular to this plane and this is another gear so when this gear will rotate this will cause rotation of this gear but here you can see the axis of this gear and axis of this gear they are not intersecting okay now this is another case this is one shaft this is another shaft they are neither intersecting nor parallel so these are called spiral gears the, the teeth look like helical gears but helical gears mean the teeth are inclined curved but they will transmit rotation between two parallel shafts but here it is the, the shafts are not neither parallel nor intersecting and the point of the contact is only point contact very weak and this kind of gears are used for low duty activities where torque power to be transmitted is reasonably low then now till now we have told that gears are used to transmit rotation between shafts but sometimes the gears can be used also to transmit convert rotation to translation or vice versa okay from translation to rotation or rotation to translation say for example rack pinion here this is a rack rack means a gear with infinite diameter so it becomes flat and this is a pinion or a gear now suppose if the gear rotates in this direction then this is wrong this will move in this direction straight path if you rotate in this direction this will move in this path straight path so rotation is converted into linear motion from input shaft to outer rack this is called rack similarly if you move it in this direction this will rotate in this direction this gear will rotate if you move it in this direction this will rotate in opposite direction so this is reversible so this has got wide application in several engineering machineries or devices okay now specification of gears how to specify a gear gears are generally specified by first you have to mention type of the gear that is is it spar gear is it bevel gear is it uh, spiral gear e bevel gear is it straight tooth or helical tooth or say hypoid gear non intersecting shafts if it is spar is it straight tooth spar gear or helical spar gear or herring bone gear this have to be mentioned next comes material which is very important because 
material of the gear should be such, it should be strong enough, it should be tough, it should be uh, wear resistive, it should be reasonably hard, it should be easily available, manufacturable, finishable, um, reasonable cost and so on. For example, the different types of materials are used for different applications. Metal, it can be metal. Most of the gears used in engineering are metal. Metal means uh, two kinds of metal, ferrum, iron base and non-iron base. Iron base again, it can be cast iron, grey cast iron or steel, both are possible. Now, non-ferrous, say aluminium alloys, these are little softer, aluminium, aluminium alloys with say zinc, magnesium, copper and so on. It can be brass, it can be bronze like that. But this will be the, the iron gears, particularly steel gears are very strong, then cast iron gears, then non-ferrous gears. Now non-metals, yes, gears can be non-metallic also, like plastics, thermosetting or thermoplastic type. It can be composite also, you know, ceramics or metal powder are mixed with uh, polymer and then you can make gears. Then comes size of the, size or major dimensions of the gear. First is a module. What is module? Module means size of the tooth. Basically, it indicates size of the tooth. That is the diameter of the gear, spar gear divided by number of teeth. Say number of teeth is ZG. This ratio is called module. So, this is an indication of the size of the tooth. ZG is the number of teeth of the gear. Theta is a helix angle of the teeth of the gear. B is the board diameter this board diameter, of course this is cutter, is not gear, uh, anyway, so this is the board diameter of the gear and B is the width of gear, okay, the what is the width of the gear, that is suppose this is the gear, if this be a gear, then this is the board, this board diameter is important as small b and the width is capital B, so the number of uh, module, the size of the tooth and then number of teeth which will decide the diameter of the gear and then the helix angle of the teeth, helix angle and then the board diameter and width. So, these are the various things to be mentioned for specifying gears. Beside that, geometry, geometry of the tooth, that means you have to mention pressure angle, so the angle between the line of engagement and the common tangent already described. A for anendum, that is height of the tooth from fish circle and dedendum, the height of the tooth from uh, root circle to up to fish circle diameter, etc. Now, special features, if any, should also be mentioned, no, but this is not compulsory. For example, bevering. Now, here is the tooth, gear tooth shown. Now, this end may be bevelled. You know, this end may be, instead of so sharp, it can be bevelled. If you bevel it, then it will be slightly stronger for engagement but it is not compulsory. Crowning, now this, you see this gear tooth is slightly crowned, okay, crowned. So, inside is slightly thicker. So, when you engage this gears, so the gear contact is very uniform and gives longer life. The tooth rounding, this tooth, the, this is the teeth of the gear which is slightly rounded. That means, if this is the tooth of the gear, it is rounded here and here. This is required for engagement. Suppose uh, there is a, suppose there is a shaft and there is one gear and there is another shaft, there is another gear. Now, this gear has to be engaged with this, okay. Now, if this is rounded, this gear, then it gives better easy contact. This is called tooth rounding. Next comes manufacture of gears, how the gears are manufactured. Now, the manufacturing stages, so there are different stages of manufacturing of gears. Gears can be done by one stage, number of steps are there or stages. Manufacturing stages depending upon type of the gear, material of the gear and desired quality that is accuracy and finish of the gear, the process will be varying. What are the different procedures? Like so here, 
preforming the blanks with or without teeth. That means first you make a disc like, okay, a disc like by say some process like say casting, forging, hot working process, and this you, you can produce it by teeth also, okay. But here the tooth will be very irregular and this will not be very accurate. And such gears can be sometimes used or are used sometimes directly without finishing in some industries where the vibration is not a factor or accuracy is not a factor, like the jute industry. Such straight cut, uh, straight preformed cast gears or forged gears are used. They are cast with tooth. But normally this is not done. What is done? These discs are produced and the discs are then machined properly to give a perfect circle with a perfect diameter. Annealing of the blank if required. Now, as I told, see after casting or forging, this will require some machining, okay, some machining for finishing to the appropriate dimension. Now, by preforming like casting and hot working like forging, this will become hard, machining may be difficult. So, this has to be annealed before the next step machining. So, after annealing, preparation of the finished blank, preparation of the finished blank by machining after annealing. Now, remember all materials do not require annealing because say cast iron, cast iron may not require, grey cast iron may require annealing. Generally steels and similar materials which become hard, uh, they require annealing. Plastic gears and other gears do not require such thing. Then production of finishing, production of teeth, on that teeth will be produced now. Either this teeth already made by casting will be properly finished or new teeth will be generated on straight cylindrical body. This is a very important part of the gear manufacturing work. Next is full or surface hardening of the machine teeth if required. Now, as I told you earlier that the tooth of the gear should be hard enough, wear resistant, okay. And for the purpose of machining, ease of machining, the blanks are softened by annealing after casting or forging, but it should be hard for wear resistance, etc. But it is not always done. Say cast iron gears need not be hardened, plastic gears need not be hardened, but steel gears, yes, it has to be hardened. Now, full or surface hardening of the machine teeth if required, like steel gears. Now, finishing of teeth. Now, if you semi finish or finish by machining, and then you require hardening, after hardening there will be certain amount of distortion on the profiles or damages or irregularities or scaling. Then after heat treatment or hardening by quenching, the finishing work like grinding may be required and is done. And finally, inspection of the teeth have to be carried out. Now the preforming of gear blanks without or with teeth. Say sand casting, what is done? The large gear blanks, large gear blanks, the disc type may be, are say produced by casting, sand casting. So sand casting is employed for large cast iron or maybe steel gears, which is not very accurate and sometimes it is produced also with tooth, but these tooth are very inaccurate and uh, they are not used uh, for precision work like machining but machine tools they can be used for jute industries or say tea industries or cement industries where it can be accepted. Now metal mold casting, now this casting will be done in metal molds where you get more accurate accuracy in the tooth form if required or on the diameter, width, the thickness of the gear blanks. Now die casting, die casting now, before that sand casting and metal mold sand, sand, sand casting are used for piece production, one or two pieces may be if required or large gears. Metal mold casting, steel, cast, steel gears, but a few number only say batch productions or piece production. But what about die casting? It is a mass production, huge volume of production of small gears, huge production, fast, rapid, one huge production of small gears of relatively soft material of low melting point. For example, aluminum, aluminum alloys like zinc, copper, uh, etc. And they are produced in die casting machine. And these gears are produced with teeth, always produced with teeth. 
and these are very quite accurate. Sometimes this DS can be used directly after die casting, but if it is a precision work, then definitely this will require certain amount of finishing by subsequent operation like machining. Investment casting, so this investment casting is a costly process, but this is used for making very precision, accurate gears straight away by casting and the material will be exotic material and the shape will be, total shape will be complicated. So for manufacture of few pieces or say lot production of uh, precision gears of exotic materials with complicated geometry are done by investment casting. Centrifugal casting, which is employed for large gears. Suppose you want to produce a very large gear, then what do you do? In case of large gears, first of all you produce, uh, you know, some internal surface, internal a ring type and then another ring, or sorry, a pulley type on that a ring is mounted. Now this ring can be, you know, used for called rims, okay. So centrifugal casting, this rim used for large gears and worm wheels are made by centrifugal casting and you know what is centrifugal casting? Rims of large gears and worm wheels. Now let us see next, gear teeth by rolling. So what we discussed that is casting process, preforming by casting. Now we shall see the gear teeth by rolling, which can be done by flat dies. Now you remember that threads, two threads can be produced by machining as well as rolling. Similarly, the teeth of gears can also be produced by machining as well as rolling. In it can be done by uh, flat dies. This is example. So this is one flat die which is moving and this is suppose another flat die which is fixed and this is the gear blank, inside is a gear blank. Now if you move into this direction then what will happen? Nothing will happen but if there are teeth like this, protruded teeth and here also there are teeth like a rack. Now if you move it then this under high pressure then lot of deformation will take place on the periphery and there will lot of gear will be produced on the periphery like this. Here there is no removal process, only the material from below the blank diameter or the piece will be shifted at the top. So material will flow from bottom to top and then this will produce the teeth like this. And this kind of gears, rolled gears are very strong and very accurate, uh, good surface finish and surface integrity. Now we can also use circular dies. Now if this one can be converted into say gradually circular, this rack is also converted into circular ring. So then this will be circular die. The circular dies are harder. So in between two circular dies, these are basically gears and put on blank, this will also achieve the gears according to the, the teeth of the rolling, the, the dies, rolling dies. It can be circular, it can be gear type as explained here. It can be worm type shown over here. This one looks like a worm and this like a, this is like a worm wheel. So this keeps on rotating and this also moves, it also rotates and tooth and throughout the surface is developed and the blank is pushed like this. This rolling process. And another one is impact type where the, this rollers work by impact on the surface to intensify the metal, deform, metal deformation and quick process. Preforming by, I'm sorry, other methods, other methods of preforming, powder metallurgy, yes. If you have proper die and punch, you put the powder material and blank and bricket it in the form of gear blank, then by sintering you get the gears. And these gears are more or less very accurate and straight way it can be used. And if you, if somebody wishes for a precision purpose, then this has to be slightly finished. But basically the finishing requirement is very less. Now the blanking in press tools, this is another method, blanking in press tools. Suppose there is a disc like, a plate like, okay, a plate and now by here is by blanking, you know, blanking is a process where the discs are produced, okay, by punching or blanking, stamping. But here 
this will be a gear like so the punch will be a gear shaped and the job that will be the, the blank that will come out that will be also a gear type so this way you know you get internal gear into the shift and out external gear into the this out piece which is coming out now this produces more or less accurate gears and smooth surface but sometimes it requires further finishing like machining and debarring etc but generally these are produced from uh, let's say the gears are of small size softer material the thinner uh, uh, size thin so that amount of force required is reasonably low and can be done by stamping work plastic work injection molding yes plastic gears can be produced by injection molding that's the process extrusion and parting now you know we can produce you know rods of different cross section by extrusion the rod will be pushed and this will go outside and this will be pressed pushed from this side now if this cavity is like a, a gear internal gear and through this material when this will pass this will also if it is the cross section that will be also like gear so now you get a long gear after that which has got teeth long teeth parallel teeth you cut to size you get large number of gears this will also produce accurate gears but not that accurate and these are small gears uh, can be used for toys or uh, watch clocks etc then another very new method has been developed called wear edm it is a new method you know edm means electro discharge machining now wear edm means there is a wear which moves uh, moves in this direction and at a potential now if you put one work piece near this with a electrolyte dielectric medium and then it will move like this then this wear will get into the job and gradually get inside and slit it and finally it will part it so this wear will gradually move inside just like a knife moves inside this is a wear edm here you can see that application of this one large gears can be produced in this way so this is a block this is the block this is a block of such much thickness and this wear will come from this source and reach here then the wear will be made to move in a curved path the teeth gear tooth profile path after that then we'll get then you take the inner portion which has been separated out you get an external gear and inside this block one internal gear so both internal gear and external gear with reasonable amount of accuracy and finish can be produced a bigger size or small size by wear edm and this wear edm it does it is very suitable for material of any hardness hard materials which are very difficult to make by other methods now come to machining production of gear teeth by machining the two basic principles are there one is called forming other one is generation now in the what is forming as it, it has been discussed earlier also in case of milling operations forming means where the job profile that you want will be the replica of the form of the cutting tool whatever form you want on the product has to be produced first on the cutting tool and then as a replica this form of the tool will be reproduced into the job this is called forming and but generation you can get very complicated shape from a simple form of the tool by method of rolling interaction let us ex ex see discuss so forming processes forming machine machining by forming principle shaping planing slotting etc friend remind remember the shaping has already become almost obsolete slotting also planing has got some use because it is it deals with large jobs so these are not and secondly these are not really used for making gear but if challenged or if required say for making one or two gear or two teeth of gears for min maintenance or repair then shaping planing and slotting can be utilized now this shows the example here is a shaping tool this is the shaping tool here the shaping tool suppose this is the gear blank and we want to produce two teeth or say number of teeth so this is the material which has to be removed bounded by two involute profile 
Now you have to take a cutting tool of the same form like the shaping tool and this will produce these slots by shaping action by the movement, shaping process. But shaping is applied only for very one or two pieces or one or two teeth for maintenance repair, very obs almost obsolete and this is for external gears. Planing if required at all then for big gears and big tooth. What about slotting? Slotting occasionally used uh, for making internal teeth because slotting can produce internal teeth, internal teeth of gears. So it has got some application in tool room or maintenance shop. Otherwise these are all so non, non productive. Now come to milling. So forming, this is also forming process, milling is also a forming process but it has got wide applications, you know. Milling by this type form cutter and N mill type cutters. Now this is the, this type, this is the cutter, this is the cutter you can see, just like a milling cutter but here you can see this is the gear tooth form which has to be produced, bounded by two involutes and here also the form of the tooth of the cutter will be also the same and this will keep on rotating and the blank will move along a direction parallel to its axis and this way the teeth will be produced. So one, the teeth will be produced one by one by indexing process. Now if the gear is, uh, the gear is very large, maybe 30 feet or 40 feet and tooth are also very big, maybe say 50 or 60 millimeter like that, then the cutter will be, if we take this type cutter, it will be very large cutter as well as the machine will be also very large. In such case, for such large gear, say end mill type gear cutters are used whose outer profile resembles the gap of the, the gap, tooth gap, the gap between two teeth. So this is the shape of the cutter, milling cutter. This is the following process. Now double helical gear, double helical gear. where suppose this is the gear which has got double helical like this. So it comes down then goes up, comes down then goes up. How this can be done? This can be done only by this method, only by end mill cutter but if there be one slit or gap, one gap then other method like Sunderland method can be used. Now the gear teeth production by machining, we are continuing forming process but here we shall discuss first production of gear teeth. That is gear teeth will produce at very high rate, very high speed. Now how this can be, but this is a forming process which is again of two type parallel bro shaping or broaching. Now let me try to uh, make it clear. Now suppose there is a, ge a gear blank, let us take white, there is a gear blank, okay, sorry. This is a gear blank. and you have to produce suppose one tooth gap you have to produce first. You can produce it by a shaping tool of same configuration. So this tooth will be like this, and this will moved in this direction, and then this will gradually moved inside. So this will be next time this will move like this, the teeth will be gradually entering, you know this gap will be done. So in number of passes you have to make this, but you can make two tooth gaps simultaneously, you can make four teeth gap, you can make eight, you can make sixteen. That means all the teeth radially will, may, will be made to move simultaneously, equally and radially. That here you can see that this is the gear blank, this is the gear blank, uh, sorry this is the gear blank and these are the tooth 
which are gradually moving radially and all of them are moving radially simultaneously and finally all the teeth are produced in one spell okay so this is a very fast process and productivity is very high accuracy is high serviceability is very good but even then it is not very popular because it is very complicated the machine is very expensive maintenance is expensive and it can produce or one you know change of the gear from one model to another one number to another is also very expensive so this is not very viable now another example here the same example so this is the gear blank and as i told you that you have to produce the tooth gap by a shaping tool first you place the shaping tool here then next here then next here then next here so this will keep on moving like this this is front view and this is the this is the gear blank and this will keep on making the slots but if you just join them it will become a single piece now if you move the single piece in one stroke the entire tooth will be produced in one stroke okay unlike shaping if one so this is the broaching okay here you can see that this teeth are joined into a strip and now if you move it in this direction this tooth gap will be produced if you take another piece this tooth gap will be produced if you take another here this will be produced that means if you take all these things in the form of a say a uh, tube and move in this direction then all the teeth will be cut in one stroke this is called broaching it is the maximum productive very high accuracy very good finish but the problem is the machine is costly the broaches are costly and maintenance repair design etc everything is very complex this is economically viable only for very very large production of a particular gears next now the gear teeth production by machining continued now the generation principle what is generation principle as i told you that production of complicated shape by simple tools here is a blank now you take a plank and a tool and this is reciprocating like a shaping tool and then when this will pass come over here this will produce a tooth gap bounded by involute so this will reciprocate perpendicular to the plane or parallel to the axis of the gear blank and this will move in this direction and the blank will rotate in this direction so this velocity and this velocity should be same that is v is equal to omega r that is a condition of rolling so this rolling is an essential feature of generation process here you can see that only one tooth can produce one tooth gap but if you want say number of teeth be produced in one stroke then what you have to do you have to take a rack like this which has got you say 1 2 3 4 so many teeth okay and now you rotate in this direction this will be moved in this direction that will cause rolling action and at the same time is a cutting action this will enable production of say involute bounded number of say four or five teeth in one stroke one spell the one to travel then if you suppose there are 40 teeth and four teeth it can make in one spell so 10 times this has to be indexed but even then the productivity is quite big and the surface finish is good and all this but what are the applications applications are straight and helical fluted gears can be produced both straight and helical to spar gears with high accuracy and finish double helical gears like herringbone gear can be produced by this method cluster gears of machine tools gear box and this is for batch production to lot production not for mass production next comes gear shaping this is very similar to gear the sunderland method the previous method rack type cutter but in this case the rack the rack cutter the rack cutter which has got a rack cutter is converted into a this is gradually bent okay and then formed into a circular rack and circular rack is nothing but a gear so this cutter is a gear but remember it looks like a gear but basically this is a high speed steel cutter and its cutting edges are very sharp 
and this reciprocates that is called cutting motion and this rotates in this direction, this rotates in this direction and you get all the teeth simultaneously, all the teeth in one spell. You need not do any indexing operation. This is external, this is internal. So internal teeth can also be produced by this gear shaping process. This is one additional feature. Briefly, additional characteristics, what are the additional characteristics over sandal method? Those are no indexing required, both external and internal gears can be made, made and higher productivity. Next comes hobbing. Hobbing is very similar to worm and worm wheel. Here you can see that this is a worm wheel, this is the worm wheel and this is the worm. Worm is nothing like a, nothing but a screw. When the screw rotates, the worm wheel rotates, okay, the worm and worm wheel. But this screw has got some gassings, okay, so that it is the, the threads are converted into some cutting edges, you see, from this cutting edges. Basically, this was a ring like and now it is converted into a milling cutter which was discussed earlier. So this is called hob. This kind of cutter which looks like worm but having number of teeth, cutting edges, you see these are the cutting edges. Because of the groove inside, because of the groove cut inside, the teeth are generated and these are made of high speed steel because it has to cut and the cutter and the gear blank behave as if a pair of worm and worm wheel. This is also generation process. Now, this is higher product, gives higher productivity because no index is required, minimum number, less number of motions, but only external teeth can be produced, spar gears and worm wheels can be produced. Well, worms are manufactured, worms are nothing but uh, screws, thread like. So they are produced by thread milling as well as thread rolling. Then comes gear, machining teeth of bevel gears. This is very interesting, which can be done in two ways either by forming process, by a milling cutter, form milling cutter as shown over here or this can be done by generation process. So this is generation process means this is a gear, here is a gear, so this is a bevel gear, this is another bevel gear. Suppose this is the gear to be produced, the teeth of the gear to be produced and this is the, this has to be kind of some of the teeth of this gear, you have taken one imaginary gear with only two or teeth, three teeth and this teeth will produce the teeth of the gear while interacting. For example, this big crown gear is taken, this axis is here. So this thing, the entire thing will rotate about this axis, a disc which has got two teeth only here, which reciprocate radially and cut the teeth on the bevel gear like this and produce this tooth bounded by two involute. So this is the principle. This two teeth reciprocating can be replaced by two rotary teeth also. But remember, here the gear blank rotates in this direction, this entire system also rotates in a particular direction just as if two bevel gears are in action. Now this is, you know, spiral bevel gears or hypoid bevel gears which also produced on the same principle by a special cutter. The movement of the cutter, the path of the cutter very similar to the teeth of the crown gear which will be meshed with the gear to be cut. The gear teeth finishing. Gear teeth are finished for better performance and longer service life, application, finishing of machined and heat treated teeth, formed teeth by uh, produced by say powder metallurgy or centrifugal casting or inducement casting, they are also produced, finished by uh, grinding process, similar process, etc. Now what are the methods? There are two methods, one is basic methods, one is uh, for soft and unhardened gears gear shaving and another one is gear rolling or varnishing. Hard or hardened gears are finished by grinding which cannot be done by shaving and lapping. For soft but precision gears, shaving followed by hardening, slight hardening and then finishing by lapping. Now rolling varnishing means the machine gears which has got slight deviations here and there will be rolled along with three, two or three hard, very harder gears and which are accurate, okay, while rolling these inaccuracies or deviations of the gear under consideration will be smeared off and you get a good gear by this varnishing action and lapping process the one gear this uh, the you have to finish has to roll along a cast iron gear and then you just put in between the teeth say paste of diamond and oil 
So, that will gradually remove the irregularities and make an excellent gear. Now, what is gear shaving? The gear shaving cutter, it can be of different type. It can be this type. It can be a gear cutter. It can be rack like. It can be worm like. Here you can see the function. This is the gear to be finished with, and this is the gear shaving cutter. Now they behave from distance, they look like a gear, they also look like a gear. But difference is, here you see the teeth of the shaving cutter. This is the teeth of the shaving cutter, which has got small grooves and raised sharp cutting edges. So when they interact, roll, this will have some relative movement, you know, axial movement. So there will be some axial movement in this direction, and that will remove the irregularities on the gear to be cut. So this is a shaving process. That means when two gears are in mesh, the gear and the shaving cutter, there will be a rolling action as usual as well as some axial movement along the tooth. So the irregularities of the tooth will be removed. Now this is a rack type. So this rack will interact with this one. At the same, this will move in this direction. This will rotate in this direction. But at the same time, this will move in this direction. This kind of shaving cutter is used for finishing the teeth of worm wheel. Then gear teeth finishing by grinding. This is a grinding process very similar to milling. This is the tooth form. This is the tooth form to be produced and you take a grinding wheel of the same profile and you rotate it and this is the gear blank. This is the gear blank here the tooth and this is the grinding wheel. Okay. So the grinding wheel will rotate at high speed and then you move it downward. So gradually this entire tooth will be finished. Now the generation principle. Here it looks similar. You see this is the this is a rack. This is basically a rack. Here you can see a rack. This is a rack like the state tooth. So one of the rack tooth has been taken on the form of a grinding wheel. So the grinding wheel will reciprocate perpendicular parallel to the axis of the wheel. Okay, it will move parallel to this axis as well as this will move in this direction. This will move in this direction these two motion say v and omega will be so related that v is equal to omega r v is equal to omega r r is the radius of the gear omega is the angular speed of the gear this will cause a rolling action and this grinding wheel will rotate at high speed and it will move parallel to the axis of the grinding wheel as you saw in the previous diagram now this will produce tooth by tooth but if you want to increase the productivity say two or three or four teeth together then you have to take this kind of grinding wheel to produce number of teeth simultaneously but for large gears of large tooth, instead of such a large wheel, you can take small wheels where the end of the disc type wheels conform the profile. So dear friends, you have now seen there are many, many methods of making gear and tooth and finishing and now we can further study from books.